and thank you for coming today. This uh, presentation came as a result of your request to learn more about Roth IRAs. So we're going to talk everything about Roth IRAs. But for reward, before we do that, <clears throat> this is uh, part of what's called Bay Area Financial Planning Days. So I'm going to share my screen. So give me a second here. I'm going to share my screen. Okay, can everybody see that? Okay, so <clears throat> the website, uh, let me copy the URL here. I will put it in the chat. Uh, okay, I'll put in the chat. All right, I'll put that in the chat. Bay Area Financial Planning Days org. It's a part of the Financial Planning Association's pro bono efforts that we do. And this is for the whole nine counties of the Bay Area. So uh, check this website for any uh, future events that we're going to be having. Uh, we host throughout the Bay Area financial planning days. And most of them are held at uh, different various uh, local public libraries. Um, you can always click here to find an event. So currently, the one event that we do have posted is the next San Francisco Financial Planning Day is going to be on October 19th, 2024. So stay tuned, stay tuned for that. And um, and you can also um, go to the website. There's the SFPL, the San Francisco Public Library YouTube channel, and there's videos of the presentations we did last year. So last year we had fundamentals of investing, cash flow. Uh, senior care needs, of course, a tax update, and saving for college. So every year, uh, topics will change. And if you have requests for certain topics, let us know, and, and, and we'll, we'll, um, we'll get that planned. Okay, so let's get started with the presentation today. So hold on for just a second here. Um, let me put up the slide deck. And um, hold on, just give me a second here. I'll, Okay, hold on here. Share screen. There we go. <clears throat> All right, and Jonathan's putting some links in the website and in the chat here. So give me a minute here. So I just need to find my presentation. Okay, here we go. All right, so Jonathan, keep us busy while I'm trying to find our presentation. Now, here we go. Okay. Here we go. Okay. All right. Uh, while that's loading up on my computer here, I will put uh, a copy of the PDF in the chat. So, um, okay. So, if you look in the chat, it's loading right now. It's going to be this PDF. Um, that you can download and you can make reference to. So that's in the chat. Um, it is uh, 80 pages. So we've got a lot to go over today. So we're going to be as efficient as we can. And um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put it in the chat and Jonathan will, will um, either interrupt me if it's appropriate or we'll hold it towards the end. All right. So let's talk about everything Roth IRAs. So first thing, a little bit about me. I'm a CPA, an enrolled agent, and a United States tax court practitioner. Those are my tax credentials. I'm also a personal financial specialist, certified financial planner, and an accredited estate planner. Those are my financial planning credentials. And I've been doing this since 1986, and I talk about taxes all the time. And also, I teach income tax at the College of San Mateo. So... Uh, this summer, I'll be teaching trusts, gift, and estates. In the fall, I'll be teaching individual taxes and, and the enrolled agent exam review course. That's why I teach at the CSM. Really enjoy doing it and trying to help more people um, get involved with this great profession of being a tax professional. I think it's an awesome job. You're always helping people, and um, I love it. I encourage it. Okay, so what are we going to talk about today? Well, you know, I, uh, retirement planning includes tax planning, and and we have a lot of different tools we can use. So we're going to talk about, we're going to focus about uh, making contributions to Roth IRAs and also taking distributions from Roth IRAs. 
And you might have heard of some of these terms here. We'll be talking about them. Uh, you probably heard of what's a, a backdoor Roth IRA, a Roth conversion, the importance of filing form 8606 um, if you have non-deductible traditional IRAs, and the importance of tracking basis. And what do you do if you inherit an IRA? Those rules have changed. Those rules are confusing and they're complicated. So we'll, we'll go through this together. So this is what we're going to cover today. So first of all, let's talk about individual retirement accounts, IRAs. So these were introduced as a result of the Employee Retirement Income Security Act of 1974, also known as ERISA. So back then, uh, what was introduced is what we know now know as traditional IRAs. And it got a whole lot more popular with the Economic Recovery Tax Act of 1981. Uh, the, the, the amount you can share was relatively low, um, but now it's uh, gotten to be a lot higher. So today, for 2024, the maximum contribution you can put into an IRA account is $7,000. Now, if you're 50 or older, if you turn 50 or older in 2024, you have a thousand dollar catch up, which means you can put eight thousand dollars into an IRA account. And the caveat there is you have to have earned income. You have to have earned income. We'll go over a definition there. So yeah, the IRAs can be open, contributions made as long as there's compensation or earned income during the year. So that's very, very important. And how about the timing? Well, this is. Uh, IRAs are one of the few things that we can do after the year is closed and still be able to reduce your taxes. So uh, you've got till April 15th of the subsequent year to fund an IRA account. So for 2023 taxes, you, you had until April 15th of 2024 to fund an IRA account. If you chose a, a traditional IRA account, it's deductible. If you decide to put it into a Roth IRA account, it's not deductible. <clears throat> now for 2022, last year, um, uh, we we had we had those winter storms. We had winter storms, which meant we had until October 16th of last year to fund your IRA account. And at the last minute, the IRS gave us another month. So for the 2022 taxes, you had all the way until November 16th of 2023 to fund an IRA account. So we had a lot of time last year. Luckily. We don't have any natural disasters in California, so that's okay. However, for other parts of the country, we had storms, we had tornadoes. Um, and in Connecticut, we almost had a dam break. Because of that, we had uh, some delays. So in some states, you have till September, uh, August, July, or June. So, so you can look those up if you're located in those states to be able to make a contribution after April 15th. So the exception are those disaster declarations. But for California, um, the, the, well, actually we do have one in California, it's San Diego County. So if you're in San Diego County, you've got until June 15th to fund your IRA account. So San Diego County, if you live there, you work there, your tax preparer is located there. Your bookkeeper, your accountant is located in San Diego, San Diego County. You get till June 15th. So that is for California. Now, previously, before 2020, there was an age limit on contributions. You were selling the half. Uh, you couldn't add to your IRA account. That has changed. There is no more age limit on contributions. As long as you're working, as long as you have earned income, you can keep contributing to an IRA. So uh, that, that, that is significant tax law change. So the other consideration to think about is what's called a spousal IRA, a spousal IRA. And in that case here, let's say you have two spouses, one's working, one's not working, <clears throat> so that other spouse doesn't have any earned income. However, as long as your overall income is over $7,000 or $8,000 um, times two, then, then you can put money into the non-working spouse's IRA account. So the joint tax return, if tax compensation is less than the spouse, the maximum contribution of lesser $7,000 or $8,000 over age 50, 
and total compensation, including grossing of both the owner and the spouse for the year. <clears throat> and that's reduced by any spouse IRA contributions for a year to a traditional IRA or any contributions for the year to a Roth IRA on behalf of a spouse. So, so don't forget about the spousal IRA. So that's a, that's a nice tax law change for us to take advantage of. So for 2024, uh, <clears throat> if you're um, um, if you're under age 50, your total combined contribution will be $15,000. 15,000 is only one spouse is over age 50, or 16,000 if both are over age 50. So here's an example here. So let's say uh, both spouses are under age 50. And let's just say Sally, Sally's income is zero. <laughs> Sally's spouse's income is $50,000. They file a joint return. So the spouse can put $7,000 to his own IRA. Sally can put $7,000 to her own IRA. So don't forget about the taking advantage of the spousal IRA accounts. All right. So first of all, what's an IRA account? Well, generally, <clears throat> and we kind of know where we can open it. We go to our, our banks, our uh, brokerages, our, our financial institutions uh, to open an IRA account. You know, for example, we go to Schwab, Fidelity, um, uh, Bank of America, Wells Fargo Bank, you know, all these financial institutions that you know, uh, including credit unions. So it's trust or custodial accounts set up in the U.S., in the U.S., for the exclusive benefit of the owner and the beneficiaries. <clears throat> so there's a IRA application form. Now, if you're a nerd like me, I read I read the whole document just to make sure there are no surprises in there. It's created by a written document. The trustee and custodian must be a bank, a federally insured credit union, a savings or loan association, or an entity approved by the IRS to act as a trustee or custodian. The trustee and custodian cannot accept contributions above the limits. Um, Contributions, except for rollover contributions, got to be in cash. Got to be in cash. You can't put property to open an IRA account. And the owner must have a non forfeitable right to the amounts at all times, which means it's your money. You can get to it anytime you want. Uh, the money cannot be used to buy life insurance. So no life insurance policies in an IRA account. And the financial institution has to follow the required minimum distribution rules. We're going to talk about that uh, a little later in this presentation. So, you know, so basically you, you, you kind of know who the usual suspects are for opening you know, uh, IRA accounts. Now we have a lim limited amount of time together today. So <clears throat> there are a lot of IRAs. IRAs come in all kinds of flavors. Um, we don't have time to talk about all of them. So this list tells you what we're not going to go into in detail. If you have time at the end, we can talk about that. So uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on traditional IRAs since this conversation is about Roth IRAs. We'll mention it, but we're not going to go into depth because there's a lot of rules. Okay. Uh, uh, another type of IRA is a simplified employee pension, also known as a SEP IRA. Uh, individual retirement annuities, individual retirement bonds, Simple IRAs, those you get through your employer if you're a small business, um, employer and employee association trust accounts, and employer-sponsored retirement plans. So we're not going to talk about 401ks, 403bs, 457s, TSPs. You know, th this could be another few hours of conversation here. So we're not going to talk about these, but if it's something you're interested in, uh, let Jonathan know, and we can... Uh, put a seminar together. All right. So, like I said, to be able to put money into an IRA account, you have to have earned income. So, here's a list of what would qualify as earned income um, <clears throat> wages, salaries, etc. So, the amount in box one of Form W 2. So, that's uh, that's pretty straightforward. You work for a company, you work for a job, you get a W-2, uh, you made uh, $20,000, there you go. There's your earned income. Commissions, you earn commissions from your work. Self-employment income, you have your own business. Report on Schedule C, that's earned income. Uh, alimony and separate maintenance. Now, that's a little tricky because the tax law changed a few years ago on this. This only applies to taxable 
alimony or separate maintenance payments. And these are for divorce or separation instruments that are executed on or before December 31st, 2018. Now, that's a little tricky, right? Because um, what if you did get divorced um, uh, before 2019 effectively? And so if you receive alimony, that's taxable to you. We can shelter that with an IRA account. However, if the divorce uh, agreement was after uh, December 31st of 2018, starting in 2019, it's not taxable if you receive it, not deductible if you pay it. However, if you modify a divorce agreement for ones that are before December 31st, 2018, you got to carefully state which tax law we're going to follow. Um, so that's very important. So get your tax advisor involved if you're going to be modifying any divorce agreements. If you're not careful about it, you can have unintended consequences. So let's say I'm representing the payer. Well, if I'm the payer, I want to make sure it's deductible. So I'm going to make sure if I modify a divorce agreement from before 2019, I want to say that, make sure we put an agreement that this shall be treated under the pre-2019 tax law. So no confusion, right? We don't want to have confusion about that. Uh, Non-taxable combat pay, even though it's not taxable, it's considered to earn the income. Ah, graduate or postdoctoral study uh, income, fellowship income, things like that. Uh, those, uh, if it's towards a graduate degree, a master's degree, a PhD degree, it's not taxable. And this was the tax law change that was made in 2019 through what's called the SECURE Act. So if it's not taxable, um, it still qualifies as earned income for purposes of higher contribution. This is a perfect situation where an, um, a Roth IRA would make sense because you don't need the deduction. That would be a perfect situation for a Roth IRA. Uh, one other item on this list that I didn't put down here is uh, if you do receive IHSS income, IHSS income, since 2014, not taxable, but you can shelter an IRA against that. So certainly something worth considering. Though. So this is earned income. Now, what's not earned income? So what's not earned income? And this is a very common mistake people make um, because they don't have earned income, but they have uh, not earned income. So earnings and profits from property, that's Schedule E, page one, that's rental income. Sorry, you can't shelter that in an IRA. Interest and dividend income, that's investment income, Schedule B. Pension or annuity income, that's reported on 1099R. Uh, any deferred compensation. So you might still get a W-2. Yes, it's true, you get a W-2, but it's, if it's deferred compensation, we cannot shelter that in with an IRA account because it's already been sheltered as deferred compensation. Okay, and income from certain partnerships, you know, mostly passive partnerships. If it's not passive, like a business, like a like a law partnership or a business that you're a partner in, then you can fund that, put an IRA against that. So, so what if you make that mistake? I've seen people make that mistake. What happens if you put money into an IRA and you're not eligible? You're not eligible. What happens? We have a 6% excise tax. 6% excise tax. How do you avoid that excise tax? Take the money out before you file your tax return. It's uh, by the due date of the tax return plus extensions, which is October 15th. So if you um, take it out, then you won't have to pay the 6% excise tax. However, if you leave the money in there, let's say uh, you made this mistake in 23, uh, you didn't fix it in 24, the money's still there in 25, then every year it's a 6% penalty. We'll talk about that in a little more detail later. So don't make that mistake because that 6% penalty can get quite expensive. All right, let's talk about Roth IRAs, putting money into Roth IRAs. Well, <clears throat> how does it work? Well, Roths have been around uh, not as long as the traditional IRAs. And if you put money into a Roth IRA, the contributions are not deductible. So you can't deduct it. However, your contributions to the Roth IRA will provide a basis in your Roth IRA. So you don't pay tax on that when you take the money out. However, we need to be really careful about this thing called the five-year rule. So what the five-year rule means is that 
to have what's called a qualified distribution for my Roth IRA, uh, I've got to have a Roth IRA for at least five years. So if you're young, open a Roth IRA now. This starts the five-year clock ticking. Now, I have a perfect example. My son. Uh, my son's going to be graduating from college in a few weeks. But when he was 16 years old, he made $853. He made $853. So we put $853 into a Roth IRA for him. At that level of income, his taxes were zero. And this when he was 16. Uh, he just turned 22. Well, guess what? That's more than five years. So he's met the five-year rule for his Roth IRA. So that's great. That's great. Uh, we're going to talk about Roth conversions later. So each Roth conversion has its own five-year rule. So you got to watch out for that. So what's one of the advantages of a Roth IRA? It doesn't matter if you're if you're covered by an employer uh, sponsored plan. If you, you know you work at a company, you have a 401k plan or a 403b plan. For a traditional IRA, that that could uh, impact your deductibility of your contribution. For a Roth IRA, doesn't matter. So a very mis a big misconception a lot of people think that oh I can't put money in a Roth IRA. I have a 401k already. No, you can have a 401k and put money in a Roth IRA. So that doesn't apply. However, uh, your ability to contribute to a Roth IRA is based upon your modified adjusted gross income limitations. So we'll talk about that. I think we're talking about that next or in a second here. All right. With a traditional IRA, you can, um, you can, it, it can be deductible or you can elect to have it not be deductible. And by doing that, uh, you report that line one of form 8606 saying it's a non-deductible IRA contribution. So line two is the basis of all your prior non-deductible contributions. So line three reports um, the total basis of all the IRA accounts. So very, very important form if you make non-deductible contributions to the IRA, because that's going to be important if you want to convert these to Roth IRAs, because we don't want to pay taxes on, on your basis. So here's a picture of Form 8606. So part one uh, is on the first page here is the non-deductible contribution to traditional IRAs. So I blew up the section here on part one, non-deductible contribution to traditional IRAs. And then the second part of this form is how to calculate the portion as taxable. But what I want to point out here is on line one is where you put your non-deductible contribution. Line two is the basis from previous years. Line three is the total. Now, not it's, it's important for you if you do this. It's also very, very important if you inherit an IRA account. You, know, you find out your uncle died, and you should ask the executor, hey, did my uncle have a Form 8606 in his tax return? Was there a basis in his IRA? You want to know that. Because the most common mistake people make is they pay tax on the entire amount when there could be some basis. So you're overpaying taxes. So we got to watch out for that. Watch out for that. All right. So here's the modified adjusted gross income limitations for Roth IRAs. And, you know, uh, for my kids, uh, my financial goal for them is to not qualify for a Roth contribution. So this is the target income here. So for verifying Jolie, that starts at $230,000. Once your income is above $240,000, you can't contribute to a Roth IRA. And then for 23, it starts at 218, phase out 228. You notice the big jump in these AGI amounts? It's because of the high inflation we've been having. Uh, these are inflation adjusted. So because of high inflation, these amounts you'll notice have really jumped. So for a lot of people here, the incomes are below these amounts. If your incomes are below these amounts, you are eligible for Roth contributions. So if you're single, uh, phase out starts at 146. You're completely phased out 161. That's a pretty good jump from 23, which is 138,000. You fully phase out 153. So take a look at your income. You got to April 15th to fund it. You'll know what your income is. And well, if you qualify, I don't think it's a bad idea to put money in there. It's going to grow tax-free. That's the power of the Roth IRA. Uh, verifying separately, not a good idea because the phase-out starts at zero. So, you know, so it's, you're either married or you're single. 
Uh, falling separately is probably not going to be very advantageous here. So your question, your question is probably, what's a MAGI, Modified Adjusted Gross Income? Well, there's a worksheet to calculate that. It's on page 40 of IRS Publication 590-A. And I got a picture of that, uh, that worksheet here. So you start with your adjusted gross income. Then you make these adjustments. And so these adjustments could be uh, contribution to traditional IRA, student loan interest, foreign earned income exclusion, foreign housing deductions, any excluded savings bonds interest, or any employer provided adoption benefits. So this is one thing you gotta be real careful about. In the tax rules, we always hear about Maggie, modify adjusted gross income. The definition of that's gonna vary uh, depending on which um, situation we're talking about. This is for Roth IRA purposes only. So which is different than the Maggie for, for example, uh, Social Security. Now, when is Social Security taxable? Or calculating my Medicare premium. So those are all different definitions of Maggie. So we see the term Maggie, but you always have to look up, okay, what's the definition? Because every one of them is a little bit of a different definition. All right, let's talk about converting traditional IRAs to Roth IRAs. So I put money into a traditional IRA. You know, I. It, so what's the downside of a traditional IRA? Well, uh, the, the upside is I get deduction for putting money in. The downside, it's going to be taxable when I take money out. Uh, I'm forced to do it uh, when I'm subject to required minimum distributions. And under current law, that's age 73. If you're 73 and older, you have to take money out of your IRA account. Well, some people don't like that. So how about if I convert those traditional IRAs to Roth IRAs? Yes, you can do that. So basically, you take the money out of your traditional IRA, you roll it over to a Roth IRA. Got to do this within 60 days. So if you take the money out of the traditional IRA, you got to put it into the Roth IRA within 60 days. Now, when you're converting a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, that could be taxable, right? If I convert $10,000 to a Roth, that $10,000 is going to be taxable. You get a 1099R for that. Um, you can do this under age 59 and a half, so there's no 10% early distribution tax. Doesn't apply, but of course this rollover is subject to tax, and you compute the taxable portion of Form 8606. Uh, you're also allowed to convert your uh, substantially equal periodic payment, also known as 72T, to Roth. You can do that, you can do that. One thing I look out for, every time you do this conversion, it has its own five-year rule. So if I do one this year, okay, the five-year clock starts. If I do it next year, another five-year clock starts. So again, plan ahead. If you plan taking money out of your Roth IRA, uh, if you're going to make a conversion, do it at least five years before. So let it season for five years. So that's what that is. All right. Now, now, what can I not convert to a Roth IRA? Well, if you're over age 73 now, you cannot convert your required minimum distributions to a Roth IRA. You can't do that. However, uh, you have to take your RMD first. Any amounts you take above that can be converted to a Roth. You can do that only after your RMD. You can't do it before the RMD. Now, one big tax law change we have is that starting in uh, 2018, no recharacterizations. Um, uh, what that means is a mulligan. And before 2018, so let's say um, you did a Roth conversion and you didn't talk to me about it. And I said, oh, great, you did a Roth conversion. You know, that's gonna cost you a hundred grand in taxes. And you go, oh no, I didn't wanna do that. So you get to April, October 15th, of the subsequent year to undo it. That law is gone now. If you do a Roth conversion, uh, you're stuck with it. So always talk to your tax and financial advisors before you do something like that. Um, I've seen people do a $3 million conversion. Well, how much taxes are due on $3 million? A lot, right? That pushes you in the top tax bracket. Does that make sense? So be very careful. There's a bunch of TikToks out there so don't get your tax advice from TikTok or the internet or from your insurance agent, car dealer, 
hairstylists or bartender. You know, just don't get tax advice from them. Or your buddies, they don't know what they're talking about. Talk to a professional. Yeah, we do this for a living. We're professionals. So let me reiterate this five-year rule. So to have a tax-free distribution from a Roth IRA, it's got to be seasoned for five years, which means there's two five-year rules. The one where you open the, the Roth, like my son did when he was 16. He's 22 now. So he's good on that contributed Roth. He can add more to it. That's fine. He's already met the five-year rule. Every conversion you make has its own five-year rule. And that's reported on page two of Form 8606. That's how we track it. Five years. So what you can't do is convert uh, your treasurer's IRA to a Roth and then take the money out of the Roth next year. You haven't met the five-year rule. It's not a qualified distribution. It could be taxable. So that's what the five-year rule is all about. Okay. Uh, so the way to do it, you can do it via a rollover. Um, uh, that, that means... You take the money out of the traditional IRA to get a check from, let's just say you got a check from Fidelity Investments, and you say, I want to convert it to my Roth IRA at, um, at Charles Schwab. Okay, get the check, walk it over to Fidelity, got to do it within 60 days. If you go past 60 days, that's a taxable distribution. So what's a safer way of doing this? It's trustee to trustee transfer. So I, I go to Fidelity and I say, hey, you know, can you can you uh, transfer this to my Schwab Roth IRA? So you give them the Schwab Roth IRA account, the Fidelity would transfer it out there. No checks are exchanged, it's all done electronically. You can't make that 60 day mistake. Or same trustee transfer. So let's say I have a, a Fidelity traditional IRA and I have a Fidelity Roth IRA. I just tell Fidelity, can you like just transfer, let's say, $10,000 from my traditional IRA to my Roth IRA? That's a trustee, same trustee transfer. So that can work out pretty well. That can work out pretty well. So, uh, again, less of a chance because uh, I've seen people make mistakes. Like Things happen, right? Um, uh, in one case, someone, uh, he had to go to the hospital. He, he took money from one brokerage firm. He's going to put in the other one. But he got delayed. Um, it's like, whoa, uh, after he left the Fidelity office, he had a doctor's appointment. Then the doctor says, whoa, we got to operate now. And, and they did. And, and, you know, and they kind of forgot about it, right? Uh, a few months later, it's like, oh, what's this check from Fidelity for? Uh-oh. So, yeah, you don't want to make that mistake. So to avoid that mistake, a 60-day rollover. Okay. Uh, a trustee, a trustee transfer. Uh, here's a picture of the bottom part of the uh, Form 8606, which is how to calculate. We're not going to walk through this in, in detail right now. We have some examples we're going to go through with it, which kind of walk through this. But it's very important to get all the bases of your non-deductible contributions. Uh, that's on line three. And, and line six says you need the value of all. You notice the word all is in bold type. Your traditional... Uh, your, your SEP and your simple IRS, um, because that's going to be the divisor. So you need to put that in there. And then um, line eight is any conversion or distribution. And then and then the formulas on lines nine through 12, that's how we calculate the taxable portion. So here's a misconception people think, is that I put money into a non-deductible IRA. All right, that's great. And I only convert the non-deductible IRA. Well, so the thing is, we have something called the aggregation rule. You have to look at all your IRA accounts. And uh, we have an example of how that how that works. So so there's a misconception, people, um, and, and so less, less educated or sophisticated financial advisors, they'll open an IRA called a non-deductible IRA, and then they'll have a deductible IRA. Doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You, you, you don't have to have separate accounts. They're all added up together. So that's how you know if your financial advisor is informed or not. Have they gone to my classes, right? So that's very important. So part two, page two of Form 8606, is conversions from traditional SEP and SIP IRA to a Roth IRA. And this is how we calculate it. So if we do this in 23, 
that's where the five-year clock runs on this conversion. It's all computed right here. Line 18 reports the taxable amount, and then that taxable amount um, uh, goes to schedule, uh, goes to the uh, front of the Form 1040, line 4B, line 4B. So line 4A and 4B, that's very, very important. Okay, <clears throat> so what's the best time for a Roth conversion? What's the best time for Roth conversions? Yeah, that's something you gotta be careful about. So you gotta do very careful planning, right? So here's some perfect situations where Roth converts make a lot of sense. Well, what if I have a low income year? You know, we had the pandemic and uh, my revenues were down, but my expenses were still there. So I've got some business losses. Well, instead of taking advantage of net operating losses or excess business losses, what if you have large uh, itemized deductions? If you if you just had the zero tax bill, you're wasting all those deductions. So a Roth conversion can kind of make sense in that case there, where you can bump up the income and still pay no taxes or low taxes. Or if you sell a rental property at a loss. Well, I had this client who, um, he bought this commercial property in uh, Minnesota, in Minnesota, at the peak of the market. And I think that was what, 2006, I guess? 2004, remember that time frame where real estate was flying sky high? Well, he, he thought he got a good deal and bought this um, commercial property in uh, Minnesota. Well, he was operating at a loss uh, ever since he had that building, and he sold it recently, and he sold it for a $400,000 loss. And I said, is that the best you can do? Is that what the realtor said? Yeah, that's the best we can do. So he sold it for a $400,000 loss. He also had $200,000 of loss carryovers. He had $2,000 of loss carryovers. So what is that? That's uh, 200 plus four. That's $600,000 of losses. And he also had large itemized deductions. So we did some math, try to keep them in the 12% bracket, let's say. Yeah, I thought that was a good tax bracket. So filled up his income up to the 12% bracket, taking advantage of his itemized deductions. And I think his conversion came out to $850,000. So what we did was, what we did was uh, converted $850,000 that would have been taxable to tax free. Perfect situation for a Roth conversion, right? So, you know, so that's where some planning comes into play. You know, if you know you have a big loss coming up, yeah, Roth conversion makes some sense. Or how about I need to bump up the tax liability? Because you can get tax credits that are non-refundable. So what's a good example of one? The electric vehicle credit. You buy an electric car and the maximum credit is $7,500. It's a non-refundable credit. So there's a client. Uh, this was a few years ago before the, the, current, um, the current rules for electric vehicles. She got a really cute Nissan Leaf. Those are really cute. It qualified for a $7,500 tax credit. And she, she said the salesman, the car dealer, said, you're, if you buy this car, you're going to get a massive tax refund. Again, don't take tax advice from a car dealer, okay? Because that's untrue. Her tax liability is only $1,000. So that meant we can only use $1,000 of the credit. The rest of it's lost. But what we did was we did some math to figure out how to get her tax liability up to $7,500. So we can use this tax credit. So, but we have to do it before the end of the year. So it's a good thing we knew about it before the end of the year, because it was tax time, nothing we can do about it. She would have lost her, her tax credit because it's non-refundable, not subject to carryover. So yeah, don't get your advice from car dealers or contractors or whatever, because you don't want to waste the tax credit. So in that scenario here, where we bumped up her tax liability to use up the credit, California does not have a similar credit. So yes, she did have to pay some California tax on the Roth conversion, but it's still a pretty darn good deal. All right, what's the other time to consider for Roth conversions? Is before required minimum distributions, which is currently age 73. Why is that? Well, by 
by shifting money from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, that's going to reduce your required minimum distribution. So that's a, a consideration to think about. Um, or uh, you, you're going to be in a higher tax bracket later. You're in a low tax bracket now. That kind of makes sense. So, you know, for our young people, for our young people, um, you know, they're right out of college, they're working their first job, uh, or they're working their first job out of high school, they're probably paying very low taxes. Perfect situations to put money into a Roth IRA. And, you know, for a lot of our younger people, they probably don't have the money to fund it. So it'd be a perfect situation where the parents or the grandparents, instead of giving them money for a gift, fund a Roth IRA. Pretty darn good deal. So for 2024, that's $7,000. And I was just talking to a grandmother the other day about it, and her oldest grandchild is working. I said, okay, well, get her, um, get her W2. Get, get, get his W-2, and you can put that amount into his Roth IRA. If he made more than $7,000, put $7,000 into his Roth IRA. He's uh, 18 years old. He's going to be going to college next year. So he's got all this time for this money to grow tax-free. Time, value, money, and a zero tax cost. Perfect situation, right? He's obviously in a lower bracket now. He will be in a higher bracket when he graduates from college gets a nice paying job, he'll be in a higher bracket. The next one I have here is securities took a dip in the higher. That's called, that's called tactical uh, Roth conversion. So for example, I, I, I can't time the market. I can't predict the stock market, but some people think they could. So, so let's say you have a stock and it, it, it just went down in value for whatever reason, but, but you're confident to go back up. So you do a Roth conversion to pay tax at that depressed value. So let's say your favorite stock went down to $10 a share. Okay, you do your Roth conversion, you'll pay uh, taxes on $10 a share. And then let's say down the road, it recovers. It's now $15 a share. It's in the Roth IRA. So you just made $5 a share tax-free. Pretty good deal, right? So I personally can't make those predictions. Uh, but but, you know, what if it goes down even further? You can't undo the Roth conversion. So we don't have that situation. Or in other situations, you're going to be moving to a higher tax state. Yeah, I know. We're in California. <laughs> we're not the highest. Uh, I guess the higher tax state would be New York State, right? New York State. So, okay, for whatever reason, you're moving to New York State, your taxes are higher. Well, you got to run some projections. you got to run some projections because... Don't listen to what you hear in the media. They're not always correct. So, for example, I was running some numbers for some clients that they're moving from California to Colorado. And I said, is your income going to be the same? He says, yeah, my income's the same. All right. So my tax projection software, I changed the CA to CO, did a comparison. His state taxes will double by moving to Colorado because of his income situation. So, you got to run some projections and and don't don't pay attention to the media because all they do is look at the table but there's more to it than the table you you, you need to do an analysis of total taxes now some taxes are higher in California we're actually kind of in the upper middle is where we stand we're not the highest believe it or not because other states have higher property taxes sales taxes excise taxes and all those sorts of things uh, I know it's very easy to pick in California saying we have high taxes. No, we don't. Not really. So it's all about your personal situation. Okay, so when we're doing Roth conversions, watch out for your tax brackets. Also, we're expecting taxes to go up in 2026 because we're currently living under what's called the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, TCJA. Uh, started in 2018 and to 2025, it'll expire at the end of 25. And the expectation is for most people, their taxes are going to go up in 26. So you might want to consider doing a Roth conversion if you're going to do one, 24 and 25. If you wait till 26 where taxes are higher, that might cost you more. Pre and post retirement. You know, what's my tax bracket when I'm retired? What's my tax bracket now? Uh, watch out for. Irma, I call it Aunt Irma. That's the uh, Medicare premiums. And it's a two-year 
a two-year look back. So whatever you do in 24, that's going to affect your 26 Medicare premiums. And, and, and you can go to the Medicare website that shows the uh, the brackets. If you're a dollar over, boom, your uh, Medicare premium is going to go up. Watch out for that. Okay, watch out for that. Uh, watch out for the net investment income tax, the NIIT. That's a 3.8% surcharge. That's to help pay for the Affordable Care Act. Um, that kicks in if you're single at $200,000. Or if you're married, at two hundred fifty thousand dollars of income. So you know, tax planning is multi-dimensional. So uh, the mistake a lot of people make is they look at one variable. So again, watch out for the internet because they they, they always only look at one variable. No, we got to be more sophisticated than that. State tax planning too. We're in California, or you're moving to Nevada, or whatever. Estate planning. Do Roth converts for estate planning purposes. So you know what's What's your tax bracket versus your beneficiary's tax brackets? Let's say you're lucky enough to have kids in the top tax bracket. Well, when they inherit your IRA, they're going to be paying taxes at the top tax bracket. Now, if they inherit a Roth, tax-free. So maybe it makes sense for you to prepay the taxes at your lower rate now. Again, we have to look at your overall planning. I wouldn't make a decision just on one variable. But that's a, these are considerations to think about. Okay, because Roth IRAs have those adjusted gross income limitations, you know, my income's too high, I can't contribute to a Roth IRA. So some clever people thought about something called a backdoor Roth IRA, a backdoor Roth. And um, uh, it's not in the tax code. You won't find this in the tax code. However, it's uh, it's been accepted by Congress. It's not the law. But we'll find some acceptance in the footnotes to the committee reports of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act. And I used to have a page reference to that, but it's in the footnotes. So it's been accepted by the congressional staff of, uh, of the Ways and Means Committee and the Senate Finance Committee. So there are some tax professionals that was concerned that, that the IRS will say this is a step transaction, that it's not legal. Well. So how do you do a backdoor Roth IRA? Well, first you put money into a non-deductible traditional IRA. You elect to not take a deduction against that. And then you distribute that to a Roth IRA. If that's the only IRA you have, there's no additional tax due. So it's a work around the Maggie limitations. However, if you have a lot of IRAs, it could be taxable. And we'll go over an example of that. And you calculate that on on form 8606 part two, page two, and each each backdoor Roth you do has its own five-year rule, has its own five-year rule. So yeah, I keep mentioning five-year rules, very, very important. Okay, so uh, I think I showed this to you earlier, it's on page two, part two of form 8606. So the, the backdoor Roth, I'm not a huge fan of them because they can be very complicated, confusing, and expensive. But what do I like instead? The mega backdoor Roth IRA. Oh, boy, that's a lot easier. However, it's got to be a feature of your employer retirement plan. So not everybody has it. Not everybody has it. So if you work for the city of San Francisco, sorry, there's no backdoor, mega backdoor Roth. However, if you work for Apple, you work for Google, you work for Amazon, uh, who else is there? Uh, Meta, all the tech companies, NVIDIA, yay. Um, they have the mega backdoor Roth. Yes, they do. So uh, you, can, you can find that on the contributions tab of your 401k fund. Log into your 401k, click on the contributions tab. So it's got to have an after-tax 401k or 403b. So nonprofits can do this too, such as uh, Stanford. If you work for Stanford, they have this. And also provides what's called an in-service distribution to the Roth. Uh, and, uh, you know, for us tax pros, it's great for our high-income clients who make a lot of money. They have high income, but they can't save a dime. So this is a great way of forcing them to save money. So, uh, so how's it work? Well, first you got your pre-tax or Roth contribution that comes in your paycheck. And for 2024, that's $23,000. Um, 
then, then employers can put money into your retirement plan, either the 3% match or any profit sharing, and the employer can decide to make it either tax deferred or Roth, and then you contribute to the after-tax uh, plan, and um, and and the overall total for 2024 is $69,000, $69,000. All right, so here's the example of the mega vector Roth. So Joe's 45 years old, so he's under 50. Works for a company that offers the mega vector Roth. You might not find that term in your 401k plan, but if you see an after-tax contribution and an in-service distribution Roth, that is a mega vector Roth. So he, he makes good money. So he, he maxes out his, his uh, pre-tax 401k, so he gets a deduction for $23,000. He works for a great company. They they have a match of profit sharing, so they put ten thousand dollar in his account. So on top of that, he can put up to thirty six thousand dollars into the after tax retirement plan, and then at each paycheck, the company does an in plan distribution to the Roth. So by doing that way, there's no additional tax, no form eighty six oh six, no ten nine nine R. So much easier than a backdoor rod. So if your employer has this, consider that. Also, if you're a small business, you have a solo 401k plan, you can add this feature to your own solo 401k plan if you're a small business. Okay, so we gotta be careful though. If you don't qualify for an IRA for whatever reason, you put too much in there, there's an extra excess contributions tax of 6%. Now, the 6% tax doesn't apply if you hold the money out by the due date plus extensions of the tax return. So if you file an extension, you got to October 15th of 2024 to fix this for 2023. So yeah, so for 2023, you got to do it by April 15th of 24, unless you find an extension that pushes you out to October 15th. We had tax law change uh, with Secure 2.0 before there was no statute of limitations. So if you if you made an excess contribution, you never fixed it. Well, that six percent penalty applies every year. Well, the the in a pro taxpayer tax law change, uh, the statute of limitations is now six years from when you file your form ten forty. So that's one change there. All right. So there's multiple ways of correcting it. So to correct excess contributions, you can withdraw the excess contributions plus any earnings by the due date. So your financial institution should tell you that, oh yeah, you, you put too much in and, and the, the earnings on that is another 500 bucks. So they'll, they'll tell you that. Now, the earnings will be taxable income, but if you're under age 59 and a half, I know it doesn't sound fair, but any earnings, uh, it could be subject to a 10% early distribution tax. If you withdraw after the due date, after the extended due date, uh, if the excess contribution is not deducted, then there's no income upon withdrawal. The other option you have is you can just carry forward the excess contribution to succeeding year. So that excess contribution is treated as a contribution for the later year. So for example, uh, you put uh, $6,000 in 2023, and you didn't qualify because you didn't make $6,000 of earned income, but in 24, you do. So you can treat that excess contribution as a contribution for the later year. So yeah, you gotta make distributions from the IRA for prior year excess contributions. So just, just be careful of that. And and the, the taxes compute on 453.29. I think I have a picture of where it is. It's a, it's a later slide. Now for Roth IRA, so that's the, the first part was for both traditional and Roth IRA. But another alternative for Roth IRAs is you can recharacterize that contribution to a traditional IRA. Oops, I don't qualify for Roth because I made too much money. Okay, you can recharacterize it to a traditional IRA. It can be deductible or non-deductible. Same timing that you got to do it uh, on or before the due date plus extension, so either April 15th or October 15th. So you can do that, but you work with your financial institution so that the reporting gets done correctly on that. 
Yeah, don't make this mistake. It's really tricky and complicated. So here's part four of 453.29, additional tax on extra contribution to Roth IRAs. So this is where it gets uh, reported here. And it's at 6%, line 25, 6% of the excess contribution. So it's not a penalty, it's a tax. So you can't uh, say, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. It won't be forgiven because it's not a penalty, it's a tax. All right, how to move money between uh, retirement plans? You can do trustee and trustee transfer. That's electronically transferring it. Rollerverse means taking a check and dropping it somewhere else. Watch out for the 60 days. The other thing with rollovers is you can only do it once every 12 months. And if you do that, do it in one transaction. So, for example, let's say I want to roll over $100,000 from, from one IRA account to another. Okay. Well, if I, if I, if I just did 20000 of the 100000 I did it within 60 days. Only the first one counts as a rollover. The one I do later is not going to count. And then it becomes treated as an excess contribution. That's when we had that 6% tax. So don't, don't use your IRA accounts as an ATM. Don't do that. It's a bad idea. Um, so the IRS has been really strict about that. So if you're going to roll over, do it in one transaction, not multiple transactions. The other way of uh, moving retirement plan assets is transfers isn't a divorce. You know, that can happen, right? It's like we balance off the assets and say, hey, you're, you've got all your money in IRA and we can transfer to my IRA. That can be moved over to you tax-free as long as you didn't take the money. It just goes into another IRA account. All right, trustee to trustee transfer. That's between uh, two financial institutions. It's not a rollover. So it doesn't get affected by that one-year waiting period between rollovers. Generally, no 1099R is generated. Uh, unless you do a trustee, a trustee transfer for a Roth conversion, then you will get a 1099R. So, yeah, don't don't um, blindly accept the code you see in box seven 1099R. They're not always correct. So, yeah, it's tax free as long as you don't take money outside the IRA and there's no distribution of money. So that's a trustee to trustee transfer, a rollover. You know, you take cash from one account, put another. Got to do it within 60 days, do it in one transaction. You can only do it once every 12 months. So, again, it's not meant to make your IRA to be an ATM, so don't do that. There's no deduction for the rollover contribution. And so, you know, so so on the tax return line 4A, you have your distribution. Let's say it's 100000 but you roll over to another IRA account, uh, let's say from traditional to traditional, it's not taxable. So line 4B will be zero. And then on the tax form, we put uh, rollover next to line 4B. Okay. All right. So that's rollovers. So what's not eligible for rollover? And this is a very common mistake I see people make. We got to be super careful about this. Required minimum distributions. You can't roll those over. You can't convert those to Roth IRAs. Okay. So that's not eligible. If you took a hardship distribution, uh, you work for a company, you took a hardship distribution from your 401k plan, that's not eligible for rollover. Um, if you're doing what's called substantially equal periodic payments, SCPP or 72T, that's when you take money out of your IRA account before age 59 and a half, and this helps avoid that 10% penalty. Those are not eligible for rollover. Um, Corrective distributions of excess contributions or excess deferrals, that's to fix that 6% excise tax. A loan that's treated as a distribution. So let's say I borrowed money from a 401k plan, but I don't pay it back. I left the company. I don't pay it back. It's treated as taxable. Not subject to a rollover. Can't roll that over. Or in many cases, like here in the Bay Area, yeah, work for Lockheed, right? If you work for Lockheed, in many cases, Lockheed 401k plan, you have Lockheed stock in there. Well, Lockheed pays a pretty good dividend. Or if you work for Wells Fargo, uh, you have a Wells Fargo 401k, you have Wells Fargo stock in there, it pays the dividend. And that dividend uh, is going to be distributed and it's reported on Form 1099R. Okay, so those are not eligible for rollover. Uh, cost of life insurance coverage is not eligible for rollover. 
Uh, here's a rollover chart. Uh, you can look at it when you when you need it. So you can it just kind of shows from where to where, yes or no, and all that. So it's a handy dandy chart if you want to double check if you can roll it from uh, from a Roth IRA to another Roth IRA. Actually, that's the only case, right? A Roth IRA can only go to a Roth IRA. It can't go to any other type of IRA. So that's what all this no across the uh, the top line here. Very handy dandy chart. Okay, transfers instant to divorce. So transfers between spouses by divorce or separate maintenance decree or written agreement. Uh, so the interest in the IRS treat as the spouse's IRA, the transfer is tax-free unless you take the money out. And there's two ways you can do it. You can either, okay, I cut this IRA for 200000 here. It's yours. All you have to do is change the name of the IRA. Just tell, let's say it's held by Bank of America. You held Bank of America. Here's the court. Here's the court order. Here's the um, the document that says to do this. Okay, change it to her name. It's hers now, not mine. Or you can make a direct transfer of IRS. It's just move the money from one account to another. But it's not taxable as long as you don't take money out of the account. Okay. I know there's some confusion with the five year rule. So this is distributions from Roth IRS. What's the beauty of that? It's tax free. However. You got to meet these conditions here. Number one is the five-year rule. So it's got to be after five years, beginning the first tax year for which a contribution was made to a Roth IRA. My son, we put uh, $853 when he was 16. Now he's 22. Boom, we met that five-year requirement. But every conversion is another five years. And uh, number two is that you got to be age 59 and a half or older, or if you're disabled, or uh, if you're inheriting, if you're it's going to a beneficiary or to an estate after death, or first-time home buyer, that's ten thousand dollars. First-time home buyer, you have a married couple, each of them can take ten thousand dollars for a Roth IRA tax-free uh, towards the purchase of a home. That's for first-time home buyer. Okay. This gets really complicated. So if it's not a qualified distribution, part of it could be taxable. But here's some ordering rules for these distributions. Number one, your regular contributions. That's basis, that's not taxable. Number two, so once you go through that layer, the next layer would be any conversions or rollover contributions. So it's on a first in, first out basis. You can't pick and choose. Uh, which conversion or which rollover. So the taxable portion is the amount required to be included in gross income because of a conversion or rollover first. And then, then you go to the taxable portion, then the non-taxable portion. Next in line will be any earnings on the contributions. So uh, what we do disregard are rollover contributions for other Roth IRAs. So if you're moving around accounts, so let's say you went from uh, B of A to Wells Fargo, that doesn't count uh, in this uh, distribution calculation. So it's only, uh, so we got this layering, we got to follow along here. So what's the advantage of Roth IRAs? No required minimum distributions. You can just leave the money in there until you die. Now, if you inherit a Roth IRA, it follows the same rules as traditional IRAs. It is then subject to required minimum distributions, same as traditional IRAs. So, yeah, so so you got 10 years to distribute, but um, but if the owner was subject to required minimum distributions, you have to take distributions in years one through nine. So here's the question you got to ask, though. You, you, you find out that you're inheriting your uncle's Roth IRA. Great, yay. You got to ask the executor, does this meet the five-year rule? If it doesn't, you got to wait five years. Let's say let's say he did a bunch of Roth conversions and all that. So hopefully uh, the executor is someone who's knowledgeable about taxes. So it's important to look at the last five years tax returns. So otherwise, uh, the inherited Roth will be taxable. So you gotta be super, super careful about that. So the five-year rule is still very important here. So part three of form 8606 is to calculate the taxable portion of a 
of a of a Roth distribution. So distributions for Roth, Roth Seth, Roth Simple, and lines 19 through 25 uh, helps us calculate it. You know, uh, it looks at the exceptions here, right? Now, first time home buyer. And line 22 is your basis from contributions. And then line 24, basis in conversions. And so from there, we can calculate line 25C, which is the taxable amount. So very important to uh, uh, be careful about. Oh, okay. I want to point this out to you because not too many people know about it. So if you have a health savings account, an HSA, uh, I'm a big fan of HSAs because you put money into an HSA, you invest it, you let it grow, uh, leave the money in there. And when you take money out for out-of-pocket medical expenses, it's tax-free. Uh, to be able to put money into it, you have to be enrolled into a high deductible health plan to qualify. So if you're working for a company, take a look at the list of your medical plan choices. If you're uh, got one that's an HSA qualified plan, they'll tell you that. However, uh, you can make a once in a lifetime distribution from your IRA to your HSA. So, you know, you, you have a qual you have a qualified for it. Uh, so for 2024, if you're if you have an individual plan, that's 4,150. For a family, it's 8,300. However, if you're 55 or older, it's an extra thousand dollar catch up. So that means if you make no contributions to your HSA in 2024, you can take 9,300 out of your traditional IRA account and roll it over to the HSA. This is better than a Roth conversion because there's no tax. If you convert it 9,300 of your IRA to a Roth, that's taxable, right? It could be taxable. So if you have this option, do some planning to take advantage of it. I think it's a great deal. Okay, inheriting IRAs. This gets really tricky. This is a whole two-hour uh, seminar in itself. So what's important is to have the appropriate beneficiary designations. So if you have an IRA account, make sure you have your beneficiary designations. Otherwise, your IRA is going to have to go through probate, which can be time-consuming and expensive. I'm not going to go into too much detail on this um, because we're running low on time. I see a few questions coming through, so I want to have some time for that. But if you inherit an IRA, you know, uh, what kind of beneficiary are you? Are you an eligible designated beneficiary, which means you can stretch your real life expectancy, or you're a designated beneficiary, which means you got to distribute within 10 years. And usually we don't recommend trusts as beneficiaries. So I don't recommend your living trust because it's a non designated beneficiary. So because of that, uh, you're either subject to the 10-year rule if you're, eligible, if you're a designated beneficiary, five-year rule or the ghost rule if you're a non-designated beneficiary, such as a trust. But if you're an eligible designated beneficiary, you take advantage of the stretch IRA account. All right. So that's generally for spouses, right? There's some plenty to do there. Non-spouses, we got to do it within 10 years. Yeah, if you're inheriting an IRA, make sure you check with the executor. Is there a basis in this IRA? We need to form 8606. For Roth IRAs, we got to make sure the five-year rule has been met. So that's super, super careful there. All right, I think this might be our last topic here, I think. Uh, okay, uh, we have the Retirement Savings Contributions Credit. So... Uh, so if you put money into a retirement account, like a 401k, an IRA, whatever, uh, you get a savers credit. Your, your income's got to be below these amounts here. It could be up to $1,000 or $2,000 if you're married fully jointly. Uh, you got to be 18 or older. You can't be claims dependent, and you can't be a student. So, you know, if you are uh, if you're went back to work uh, after you retired, you put money in there, you get a $1,000 tax credit. So here's the table of the eligible amounts. Okay. Um, all right. So I got a bunch of examples here. Tell you what, I will circle back to the examples after I go over your questions, okay? Because uh, I can't believe how fast our time has flown. So, so Jonathan, um, this is slide number 52. So I'll, I'll loop back to the examples. So, because uh, I want to go over the questions first. And these examples are kind of helpful. So let me just uh, let me just go over past the examples here. Let's go over some resources. 
So IRS publication 590-A is uh, 61 pages, but talks about contributions to IRA accounts. The sister publication is publication 59-3. That's distributions from IRA accounts. Very detailed. It's got all the tables there. It's very, very helpful. Um, this kind of summarizes the pros and cons of traditional IRAs. What's the pros? Uh, you get tax deduction. Putting, putting money in there, it grows tax deferred. What's the cons? It's taxable. When you take money out, you're subject to RMDs. And for estate planning, your beneficiary is going to pay tax on that. Roth IRAs? It grows tax-free. That's the biggest strength of it, right? Not subject to employee uh, company uh, plan limitations. Your beneficiaries get it tax-free, no RMDs. Disadvantage, no tax deduction. You might have uh, uh, modified adjusted gross income limitations or the five-year rule. Okay, uh, some more resources, Form 8606 and instructions here. Ah, two articles I'm gonna put you on to which I was quoted in. So uh, in the Wall Street Journal, I was interviewed by Ann Turkison. She's the retirement reporter of the Wall Street Journal. Highly recommend reading her articles. Mm -hmm. They're very good. She She's the retirement reporter. So she interviewed me for this article about America's required retirement income has never been higher. Why is that? Well, because the stock market was high. It's high now. So, you know, because of that, higher distributions. And on April 25th in Forbes, uh, Michelle Lodge interviewed me for this article about the mega backdoor Roth. Is it right for you? How to figure it out. So these are two very helpful articles to read. A couple of future events we have here at the San Francisco Public Library. On September 4th, we're gonna have the Small Business Financial Literacy event. This is gonna be our third annual. Yeah, third annual, our third annual. Right, it's a collaboration with the IRS, Small Business Administration, the Better Business Bureau, California Society of CPAs, among other uh, organizations. Um, it's at 10 o'clock to noon at the main library downstairs. Um, you know, we especially want to reach uh, underrepresented groups out there. There's a lot of benefits for small business most people don't know about, and we want to get the word out. And uh, Financial Planning Day is going to be Saturday, October 19th for the San Francisco Main Library. All right, Jonathan, uh, let's uh, let's take a look at the questions. Should we, should we start the top or start at the bottom here? What do you think? Uh, maybe start at the the top, just because um, maybe there might be a logical okay. progression there. All right. Well, Jonathan, thank you for posting all this information in the chat. Yeah, the library's got some great resources. You also have uh, a financial coaching program, which is great. In San Francisco, we got the Office of Financial Empowerment. They got a lot of great programs, so definitely take a look at their website for that. I'm going to post some links to both uh, Smart Money Coaching and Advisors Give Back in the chat. These are exactly. two great resources. Everyone should uh, take a look at them. That's right, because... Uh, you know what's scary is there's a lot of scammers out there, so don't get taken by them. Okay, let me see. Molly's got a question here. I'm 81 years old. I want to convert my traditional to a Roth. I'm in a 22% bracket. This is a good time to convert. Well, I don't know, right, Molly? Because it all is going to depend on, 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 on what your plans are, who the money's going to go to when you're gone, and are you willing to pay the tax on the conversion? So, you know, it's to be honest with you, I, I, th I think we'll illustrate those in the examples. We'll, we'll illustrate those in the examples. Okay, so hang on. We're going to go over the examples after we go through these questions. So, Jonathan, is it okay for us to go past our allotted time? Yeah, well, um, let's try to um, maybe keep it um, about five minutes past okay. uh, All right. the 3.30. All right, Julie's got a question here. His spouse plans to take Social Security 62. Can he contribute to an IRA? Well, that's a good question, right? So does that spouse qualify for a spousal IRA? And, and do we have enough earned income to qualify for it? And does it make sense to do that? Also, most important question is, does it make sense for your spouse to claim Social Security early? The earliest you can claim is, say, 62, but you take a substantial discount for the rest of your life. You know, the break-even, depends on who you ask, is around 78 to 82, somewhere around there. Um, the earliest you can claim is 62. You max out at age 70. 
And, and then depending on what year you're born, there's a full retirement age. I generally don't recommend 62 unless you expect to die sometime soon. Okay. Anna, what is the minimum income for a single person over seven to open an IRA? The minimum income is your earned income. So if you want to contribute a dollar, you need a dollar. Uh, if you want to do the whole 7,000, you need 7,000 of earned income. So, you know, this is based on your earned income. Can IRA contribution be stocks or ETFs? No, you have to contribute cash and you can use the cash in the accounts to buy the stocks or ETFs. All right. Laura, can I sell ETFs to buy other ETFs within a Roth? Not taking a not have capital gains. Yeah. So that's one of the beauty of an IRA account. Doesn't matter if it's traditional or Roth, you can buy and sell um, and no capital gains taxes. However, if you incur a capital loss, sorry, can't claim the loss. So, so try not to have losses in your IRA accounts. Julie here, K1 income is not earned income, right? Well, that depends. It depends on what the K-1 is for. If it's uh, investment income, no, it doesn't. If it's a, uh, a business partnership, like a law partnership, uh, a business partnership, then the answer is yes. So it, it kind of depends. If you work for IHSS as a caregiver, can you put this income in an IRA since it's not taxable if you are the living caregiver? Yes, I, I mentioned that earlier. And I would recommend a Roth IRA in that case. Can you put this earned income to Roth? Oh, yes. Yes. <laughs> you answered your own question, uh, Diane. Okay, Matt. So pensions such as PERS and CalPERS are not earned income. That's true. If you're receiving a pension, that's not considered earned income. You can't put an IRA against that. Laura here. Okay. Also brought mutual fund in Roth before 2012, so don't know what the actual cost is. Brokerage didn't have to figure out before 2012. Is this a problem? When I take money out, it's tax-free. What if I bought the fund? Okay, from a tax standpoint, uh, if you're talking about Roth IRA, as long as you met all the requirements of a qualified distribution, we don't care about the basis. It's going to be tax-free. However, if it's taxable, then what we need to uh, keep track of it's not not what the basis in the fund is, but the basis in your contributions. But 2012, that's more than five years ago, so we're good there. Okay, let's see, Gary. Okay, we talked about rollovers, right? Okay, Julie, can we take ETFs and mutual funds from traditional IRA to the Roth IRA without signing up funds? Uh, that's a good question. I think the general answer is no. I think you have to sell it and take the cash. Talk to your financial, financial institution if you can do what's called an in-kind transfer. So check with your financial institution. So it's going to vary. All right, Al, let's see. Al, I have an annual $800 um, tax of group term life insurance or the national zone W-2 for my former employer. Life insurance is a company benefit. I'm retired and not working. Is this $800 because they're earned income for our purposes? No, it's not. Okay, Diane, what company would you recommend to best open a Roth IRA? Um, well, you know, all the financial institutions are pretty good. I think what's more important there is uh, picking the appropriate investments. And personally, I'm a big fan of low cost investments, not high cost. So I'd stay to one, I stay away from the investments that charge a commission, something like that. So uh, uh, what, what do they call that? Um, no commission, no commission type funds. Uh, ETFs, uh, generally no commissions, but you know, check with the financial institution. All right, what's a 1099R? 1099R is a form the, the payer of an IRA distribution or pension distribution to report the, the gross amount and the tax amount and the withholding federal and state. Okay, Laura, so an ETF that's gone down in my rollover, IRAs would have uh, and my roller IRA would be a good time to convert, no capital gains as costs shows higher than current. So no, if you're buying and selling funds within your IRA accounts, there's no capital gains or losses. And we talked about a strategic Roth conversion, you know, that could be a consideration. So let's say my investments went down, but I'm confident it'll come back up again. So I'll pay taxes on that depressed price. And then, and then when it pops back up, then I made some money tax-free. Okay. 
We're going through this pretty quick, Jonathan. Let's see. Uh, okay, Lavon's got a question. I have two IRS, one traditional, one Roth, since 20 years or more ago for both. I am making contributions to the traditional IRA. I'm considering changing that to make a contribution to Roth IRA. What do you think? Well, that's a good question. It depends, right? It depends on your financial situation. It depends on your financial goals. It depends on what tax bracket you're in now, your tax bracket in the future. So unfortunately, I can't really comment on that because there's a lot of bit of analysis that goes in there. And I think our examples might illustrate some of that. We're going to go through the examples pretty quickly. Okay, Julie, for non deductible traditional IRA, the contribution is not deductible. So the earnings would not be taxable, correct? No. If you put money into a non deductible traditional IRA, you don't get a deduction from the contribution, but the earnings will grow tax deferred. So, for example, let's say I put $7,000 in a non deductible traditional IRA. Well, it grows to $8,000, and I, and I take that $8,000 out of that non deductible traditional IRA, I'm going to pay tax on $8,000 minus $7,000, $1,000. So it just gets deferred. I'll pay tax on it later. Not tax-free, just tax-deferred. Well, the one-time distribution money for IRA to HSA not counted as income. Right. It's not counted as income, not a taxable distribution. That's why it's such a better, uh, uh, better than a Roth conversion. Okay. All right. Okay. Oh, wow. Jonathan, I think we went through all the questions pretty, pretty good there. So let's spend the last few minutes together. I'm, I might not go over all the examples. I, I just happen to have 10 different examples here. Um, okay. Okay. Example one. Okay. This is a question of. You know, how much can Raj put into a deductible traditional IRA or Roth IRA? Raj is single, he works at a university, he makes 80000 a year, he's 35 years old, and the university has a pension plan. So that means he is covered by an employer retirement plan. And so I got that, so I got that consideration there. So, and because he's covered by a, a retirement plan, the amount, he can put 7000 into his IRA, but only 4,900 will be deductible. However, no restriction for Roth IRAs, so the full $7,000 is eligible for a contribution. Okay, okay, example number two here. Um, uh, this is for a married couple. Howard and Bernadette, they're married. Bernadette makes under 50. She is covered by her employer's plan. Howard earns 75 and not covered by retirement plan. So we're looking at Howard here. How much can he contribute? So, uh, so since uh, Bernadette's covered by a plan and she makes 150k, so um, Howard could put 7,000 into his <laughs> traditional IRA and be able to deduct it. Uh, Bernadette cannot. However, for Roth IRA, uh, their income's right below the phase-out range. Uh, they're at 225 of income. Phase-out starts at 230, so they can each put $7,000 into a Roth IRA. Okay. Let's see, do I want to go over this one? Okay, let's do this one. Uh, this is a good one. This is a Roth conversion question here. Will's 51 years old. He's got a million dollars in his traditional IRAs. He puts $8,000 into a non-deductible traditional IRA. This is his only uh, non-deductible IRA. So there's no basis in the traditional IRA because they all came from rollovers from previous employers. So he wants to convert this $8,000 to a non-deductible, so to a Roth. This is the backdoor Roth, right? Known as a backdoor Roth. How much is taxable? Well, the, the total value of the IRA is a million dollars. He put 8,000 into a non-deductible. So his basis is $8,000. He's converting $8,000. And I'm covering up the answer here. So the tax-free portion, the math comes up to be 0 0.0079. So the taxable is $8,000. Roth conversion, the taxable amount is 7937 almost a whole amount. But what can Will do to reduce that? Well, he takes that million-dollar uh, rollover IRA, because it came from previous IRAs, he rolls into his current employer's 401k plan, so line one is blank here. He has no IRAs. 
he only has the eight thousand dollar non-deductible contribution. He converts that, and so the tax on that eight thousand dollars is zero. So that's the again. That's why we want to plan ahead. If you want to take advantage of this. Uh, okay, this is the R&D question. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, I think this one is an inherited one, so we're going to skip that one. Let's see, this is another inherited one. We'll skip that one. Is that an inherited one? Oh, this is if you if you marry someone 10 years younger than you, more than 10 years younger than you. We're not going to go over that. That wasn't the subject of our conversation here. Oh, let's do this one. Leonard is trying to decide whether you should do, where should we put his money? A taxable account, which is your regular brokerage account, a non-deductible IRA, or a deductible IRA, or Roth IRA? Which one Which one should he do? Well, that's a good question. Um, so let's say he puts $7,000 into his IRA, just making this up. He does it for 30 years. Good for you, Leonard. Uh, he, um, uh, he, let's say it earns uh, 5%. Uh, and then we get a little more conservative and we're taking money out, so that's at 4%. And let's say its tax bracket doesn't change. No change in tax brackets pre- and post-retirement. So in this calculation here, if you look at the, the different types of accounts we use, it looks like um, the Roth IRA end up with the most money, 814000 versus the non-taxable, the brokerage, the rent account. Look, that's only 504000 because you're paying taxes on the earnings. So this is an illustration of the tax impact of the four type of accounts. And that's just this example here where it doesn't have a change in um, change in uh, tax brackets. Uh, number nine, Penny, she, she, she's she got a great job. She's making good money. Should she put money into a Roth 401k or a traditional 401k? So let's say she makes 200,000 a year. Good for you, Penny. And she puts 10% of her paycheck away. The company puts 3% match in there. And so that's 13% of her income, 26000 a year. She does it for 20 years. And let's say uh, she's in a 24% bracket now when she's working. And she's going to drop to the 15% bracket when she's retired. Well, in this example here, uh, because her income is high when she's working, her tax will be low when she's retired. It uh, looks like the regular 401k is better than the Roth 401k in this example here. So with the regular 401k, uh, she can have $1,479,000 versus a Roth, $1,432,000. Versus you take that same money, put it in a brokerage account, that's only, what does it say, $840,000. So again, be very careful when you're giving unsolicited advice about where to put your money. I think the last one is Stuart heard about Roth conversions for his friend Raj. So does that make sense for Stuart? Well, in Stuart's case here, uh, he wants to convert $30,000 of his uh, of his uh, traditional IRA to a Roth IRA. He's got no basis, so it'd be all taxable. But Stuart, you know, he's the guy that owns the comic store so his taxes are pretty low. He's got a low tax bracket, and he'll be in a lower tax bracket when he uh, when he uh, actually uh, actually retires. So in this case here, that thirty thousand will be fully taxed. But he's got to pay tax on it, and it looks like that it's better to leave your money in the traditional IRA. Don't do a Roth conversion. So you know the answer is going to vary. That's why when when so when you ask like, should I do it or not? Well, I don't know. It depends. Uh, there's a lot of analysis we need to do. All right, so that takes us to the end of our presentation. Looks like, Jonathan, we're ending right on time. Did I miss any new questions here? There were two at the very end. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, okay, they're good here. So Sheila's got a question about, can you transfer to HSA if you're taking Social Security? Uh, the answer to that is yes. However, should you be taking Social Security? However, the answer is no. If you're eligible for Medicare, once you're eligible for Medicare, you cannot add to your HSA. You cannot do the roller. So if you want to do that, do that before uh, you're eligible for Medicare. Diane's got a question. What are low cost investments? Investments that are not expensive. You know, those tend to be um, index funds, um, uh, lower cost providers such as Vanguard, uh, Schwab. They tend to have some 
lower cost investments. I stay away from the more expensive ones, especially ones that charge a commission or uh, some are very high commissions. So I'm not a big fan of those because uh, you, you do your research, take a look at uh, expenses. Expenses matter because that's the amount of money you're losing from your investment. So you got to pay those expenses before you even make any money. So there's a lot of a lot of good choices out there. You just got to do your research, do your study. A good um, resource is Morningstar. Morningstar's got some great examples to look at. And I'm sure the library, uh, I think you have some newsletters there that are helpful that can help you uh, look for these type of things. But yeah, we um, we actually have a subscription to Morningstar. If you're interested in checking that out, um, it's a digital subscription. You can access it from home. Um, head to our webpage. Um, you'll find more information about that. And Morningstar's got some very good articles. They also have a very good podcast. I highly recommend listening to. Um, also, Morningstar, Morningstar is an independent service that does ratings. So, you know, you, you kind of want to stay with the gold star funds, you know, Um I stay away from the no star funds. <laughs> so that's what I do here. So thank you for your time today. Thank you for all your good questions. We love doing this. And um, if there's other topics you'd like to hear us do, uh, either me or another volunteer will, will be more than happy to give a presentation. Send send those uh, comments to Jonathan. We'll take a look. And um, But we do have a couple of events coming up in the fall here. So we look forward to seeing you then. And tell your friends about it. Thank you so much, Larry. This was great. Um, it's clear that this is such an important tool for people to use. And as you described, it can it can be a, there's a lot of uh, detail involved. So I think this was really helpful um, to explain how this works. And I want to encourage everyone, um, you know, check out our resources at the library if you want to maybe learn more about things you heard about today. Um, we have resources we could direct you to. Um, like Advisors Give Back is a really good program if you want to speak to someone one on one about some of these options. Um, so, yeah, please uh, visit our website, come visit us in person. And I'll be sending out a copy of this recording and the slideshow along with a very brief survey. Um, please um, take a moment to fill out the survey. It's anonymous. We want to hear how we're doing. And it's a good place to let us know what you'd like to see. Um, we take those seriously, and uh, it helps us design our programming here at the library. So um, I think we're going to end now. Um, thank you, everyone, for being with us today on Saturday. And thank thanks again, Larry. This was great. All right. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, everybody. We'll see you again.